Book 21, The Test of the Bow Upon Penelope, most worn in love and thought, Athena cast a glance like a grey sea lifting her. Now to bring the tough bow out and bring the iron blades. Now try those dogs at archery to wash her bloody slaughter in. So moving stairward the queen took up a fine door hook of bronze, ivory, hafted, smooth in her clenched hand, and led her maids down to a distant room, a storeroom where the master's treasure lay, bronze, bar gold, black iron forged and wrought. In this place hung the double, torsion bow and arrows in a quiver, a great sheaf, quills of groaning. In the old time in Lake Damon her lord had got these arms from Aphidos, your Edo's son. The two met in Messenia at Ortolocos' table, on the day Odysseus claimed a debt owed by that realm, sheep stolen by Messenians out of Ithaca in their long ships, three hundred head, and herdsmen. Seniors of Ithaca and his father sent him on that far embassy when he was young. But Aphidos had come there tracking strays, twelve shy mares, with mule colts yet unweaned. And a fatal chase they led him over prairies into the hands of Heracles. That massive son of toil and mortal son of Zeus murdered his guest at wine in his own house, inhuman, shameless in the sight of heaven, to keep the mares and colts in his own grange. Now Aphidos, when he knew Odysseus, gave him the master bowman's arm, for old Eurytos had left it on his deathbed to his son. In fellowship Odysseus gave a lance and a sharp sword. But Heracles killed Aphidos before one friend could play host to the other. And Lord Odysseus would not take the bow and the black ships to the great war at Troy. As a keepsake he put it by, it served him well at home in Ithaca. Now the queen reached the storeroom door and halted. Here was an oaken sill, cut long ago and sanded clean and bedded true. Foursquare the door jams and the shining doors were set by the careful builder. Penelope untied the strap around the curving handle, pushed her hook into the slit, aimed at the bolts inside and shot them back. Then came a rasping sound as those bright doors the key had sprung gave way, a bellow like a bull's vaunt in a meadow, followed by her light footfall entering over the plank floor. Curb, scented robes lay there in chests, but the lady's milk-white arms went up to lift the bow down from a peg in its own polished bow case. Now Penelope sank down, holding the weapon on her knees, and drew her husband's great bow out, and sobbed and bit her lip and let the salt tears flow. Then back she went to face the crowded hall tremendous bow in hand, and on her shoulder hung the quiver spiked with coughing death. Behind her maids bore a basket full of axe heads, bronze and iron implements for the master's game. Thus in her beauty she approached the suitors, and near a pillar of the solid roof she paused, her shining veil across her cheeks, her maids on either hand and still, then spoke. To the banqueters, my lords, hear me, suitors indeed, you commandeered this house to feast and drink in day and night, my husband being long gone, long out of mind. You found no justification for yourselves, none except your lust to marry me. Stand up, then, we now declare a contest for that prize. Here is my lord Odysseus hunting bow. Bend and string it if you can. Who sends an arrow through iron axe, held sockets, twelve in line? I join my life with his, and leave this place, my home, my rich and beautiful bridal house, forever to be remembered, though I dream it only. Then to Eumaeus, carry the bow forward. Carry the blades. Tears came to the swineherd's eyes as he reached out for the big bow. He laid it down at the suitor's feet. Across the room the cowherd sobbed, knowing the master's weapon. Antinous growled, with a glance at both, clods. They go to pieces over nothing. You two there, why are you sniveling? To upset the woman even more? Has she not pain enough over her lost husband? Sit down. Get on with dinner quietly, or cry about it outside, if you must. Leave us the bow. A clean, cut game, it looks to me. Nobody bends that bow stave easily in this company. Is there a man here made like Odysseus? I remember him from childhood, I can see him even now. That was the way he played it, hoping inwardly to span the great horned bow with corded gut and drill the iron with his shot, he, Antinous, destined to be the first of all to savor blood from a biting arrow at his throat, a shaft drawn by the fingers of Odysseus whom he had mocked and plundered, leading on the rest, his boon companions. Now they heard a gay snort of laughter from Telemachus, who said then brilliantly, a queer thing, that. 
Has Zeus Almighty made me a half, wit? For all her spirit, mother has given in, promised to go off with someone, and is that amusing? What am I cackling for? Step up, my lords, contend now for your prize. There is no woman like her in Achaia, not in old Argos, Pylos, or Mycene, neither in Ithaca nor on the mainland, and you all know it without praise of mine. Come on, no hanging back, no more delay in getting the bow bent. Who's the winner? I myself should like to try that bow. Suppose I bend it and bring off the shot, my heart will be less heavy, seeing the queen my mother go for the last time from this house and hall, if I who stake and do my father's feet he moved out quickly, dropping his crimson cloak, and lifted sword and sword belt from his shoulders. His preparation was to dig a trench, heaping the earth and a long ridge beside it to hold the blade's half, bedded. A taut cord aligned the socket rings. And no one there but looked on wondering at his workmanship, for the boy had never seen it done. He took his stand then on the broad door sill to attempt the bow. Three times he put his back into it and sprang it, three times he had to slack off. Still he meant to string that bow and pull for the needle shot. A fourth try, and he had it all but strung, when a stiffening in Odysseus made him check. Abruptly then he stopped and turned and said, Blast and damn it, must I be a milksop all my life? Half, grown, all thumbs, no strength or knack at arms, to defend myself if. Someone picks a fight with me. Take over, O oh my elders and betters, try the bow, run off the contest. And he stood the weapon upright against the massy, timbered door with one arrow across the horn slant, then went back to his chair. Antinous gave the word, now one man at a time rise and go forward. Round the room in order, left to right from where they dipped the wine. As this seemed fair enough, up stood Leodes the son of Oinops. This man used to find vision for them in the smoke of sacrifice. He kept his chair well back, retired by the wine bowl, for he alone could not abide their manners but sat in shame for all the rest. Now it was he who had first to confront the bow, standing up on the broad door sill. He failed. The bow unbending made his thin hands yield, no muscle in them. He gave up and said, friends, I cannot. Let the next man handle it. Here is a bow to break the heart and spirit of many strong men. I. And death is less bitter than to live on and never have the beauty that we came here laying siege to so many days. Resolute, are you still, to win Odysseus Lady Penelope? Pit yourselves against the bow and look among the Chians for another's daughter. Gifts will be enough to court and take her. Let the best offer win. With this Leodes thrust the bow away from him, and left it upright against the massy, timbered door, with one arrow aslant across the horn. As he went down to his chair he heard Antinous' voice rising, What is that you say? It makes me burn. You cannot string the weapon, so here is a bow to break the heart and spirit of many strong men. Crushing thought. You were not born, you never had it in you, to pull that bow or let an arrow fly. But here are men who can and will. He called out to the goat herd, Melanthios, kindle a fire there, be quick about it, draw up a big bench with a sheepskin on it, and bring a cake of lard out of the stores. Contenders from now on will heat and grease the bow. We'll try it limber, and bring off the shot. Melanthios darted out to light a blaze, drew up a bench, threw a big sheepskin over it, and brought a cake of lard. So one by one the young men warmed and greased the bow for bending, but not a man could string it. They were whipped. Antinous held off, so did Eurymachos, suitors in chief, by far the ablest there. Two men had meanwhile left the hall, swineherd and cowherd, in companionship, one downcast as the other. But Odysseus followed them outdoors, outside the court, and coming up said gently, you, herdsman and you too, swineherd, I could say a thing to you, or should I keep it dark? No, no, speak, my heart tells me. Would you be men enough to stand by Odysseus if he came back? Suppose he dropped out of a clear sky as I did? Suppose some god should bring him? Would you bear? Arms for him, or for the suitors? The cowherd said, Ah, let the master come. Father Zeus, grant our old wish. Some courier guide him back. Then judge what stuff is in me and how I manage arms. 
Likewise Eumaeus fell to praying all heaven for his return, so that Odysseus, sure at least of these, told them, I am at home, for I am he. I bore adversities, but in the twentieth year I am ashore in my own land. I find the two of you, alone among my people, long for my coming. Prayers I never heard except your own that I might come again. So now what is in store for you I'll tell you. If Zeus brings down the suitors by my hand I promise marriages to both, and cattle, and houses built near mine. And you shall be brothers, in, arms of my Telemachos. Here, let me show you something else, a sign that I am he, that you can trust me, look, this old scar from the tusk wound that I got boar hunting on Parnassos, Autolycos sons and I. Shifting his rags he bared the long gash. Both men looked, and knew, and threw their arms around the old soldier, weeping, kissing his head and shoulders. He as well took each man's head and hands to kiss, then said, to cut it short, else they might weep till dark, break off, no more of this. Anyone at the door could see and tell them. Drift back in, but separately at intervals after me. Now listen to your orders, when the time comes, those gentlemen, to a man, will be dead against giving me bow or quiver. Defy them. Eumaeus, bring the bow and put it in my hands there at the door. Tell the women to lock their own door tight. Tell them if someone hears the shock of arms or groans of men in hall or court, not one must show her face, but keep still at her weaving. Philoishios, run to the outer gate and lock it. Throw the crossbar and lash it. He turned back into the courtyard and the beautiful house and took the stool he had before. They followed one by one, the two hands loyal to him. Eurymachos had now picked up the bow. He turned it round and turned it round before the licking flame to warm it up, but could not, even so, put stress upon it to jam the loop over the tip though his heart groaned to bursting. Then he said grimly, curse this day. What gloom I feel, not for myself alone, and not only because we lose that bride. Women are not lacking in Achaia, in other towns, or on Ithaca. No, the worst is humiliation, to be shown up for children measured against Odysseus, we who cannot even hitch the string over his bow. What shame to be repeated of us, after us. Antinous said, come to yourself. You know that is not the way this business ends. Today the islanders held holiday, a holy day, no day to sweat over a bowstring. Keep your head. Postpone the bow. I say we leave the axes planted where they are. No one will take them. No one comes to Odysseus Hall tonight. Break out good wine and brim our cups again, we'll keep the crooked bow safe overnight, order the fattest goats Melanthios has brought down tomorrow noon, and offer thigh bones burning to Apollo, god of archers, while we try out the bow and make the shot. As this appealed to everyone, heralds came pouring fresh water for their hands, and boys filled up the wine bowls. Joints of meat went round, fresh cuts for all while each man made his offering, tilting the red wine to the gods, and drank his fill. Then spoke Odysseus, all craft and gall, my lords, contenders for the queen, permit me, a passion in me moves me to speak out. I put it to your Eurymachos above all and to that brilliant prince Antinous. Just now how wise his counsel was, to leave the trial and turn your thoughts to the immortal gods. Apollo will give power tomorrow to whom he wills. But let me try my hand at the smooth bow. Let me test my fingers and my pull to see if any of the old time kick is there, or if thin fair and roving took it out of me. Now irritation beyond reason swept them all, since they were nagged by fear that he could string it. Antinas answered, coldly and at length, you bleary vagabond, no rag of sense is left you. Are you not coddled here enough, at table taking meat with gentlemen, your betters, denied nothing, and listening to our talk? When have we let a tramp hear all our talk? The sweet goat of wine has made you rave. Here is the evil wine can do to those who swig it down. Even the centaur Eurytion in Pirithu's hall among the Lapithae came to a bloody end because of wine. Wine ruined him, it crazed him, drove him wild for rape in that great house. The princes cornered him in fury, leaping on him to drag him out and crop his ears and nose. Drink had destroyed his mind, and so he ended in that mutilation, fool that he was. Centaurs and men made war for this, but the drunkard first brought hurt upon himself. The tale applies to you, I promise you great trouble if you touch that bow. You'll come by no indulgence in our house, 
kicked down into a ship's bilge, out to sea you go, and nothing saves you. Drink, but hold your tongue. Make no contention here with younger men. At this the watchful Queen Penelope interposed, and Tinus, discourtesy to a guest of Telemachos, whatever guest, that is not handsome. What are you afraid of? Suppose this exile put his back into it and drew the great bow of Odysseus, could he then take me home to be his bride? You know he does not imagine that. No one need let that prospect weigh upon his dinner. How very, very improbable it seems. It was Eurymachos who answered her, Penelope, O daughter of Icarios, most subtle queen, we are not given to fantasy. No, but our ears burn at what men might say and women too. We hear some jackal whispering, how far inferior to the great husband her suitors are. Can't even budge his bow. Think of it, and a beggar, out of nowhere, strung it quick and made the needle shot. That kind of disrepute we would not care for. Penelope replied, steadfast and wary, Eurymachos, you have no good repute in this realm, nor the faintest hope of it, men who abused a prince's house for years, consumed his wine and cattle. Shame enough. Why hang your heads over a trifle now? The stranger is a big man, well, compacted, and claims to be of noble blood. Ay, I? Give him the bow, and let us have it out. What I can promise him I will, if by the kindness of Apollo he prevails he shall be clothed well and equipped. A fine shirt and a cloak I promise him, a lance for keeping dogs at bay, or men, a broadsword, sandals to protect his feet, escort, and freedom to go where he will. Telemachos now faced her and said sharply, Mother, as to the bow, and who may handle it or not handle it, no man here has more authority than I do, not one lord of our own stony Ithaca nor the islands lying east toward Ellis, no one stops me if I choose to give these weapons outright to my guest. Return to your own hall. Tend your spindle. Tend your loom. Direct your maids at work. This question of the bow will be for men to settle, most of all for me. I am master here. She gazed in wonder, turned, and so withdrew, her son's clear-headed bravery in her heart. But when she had mounted to her rooms again with all her women, then she fell to weeping for Odysseus, her husband. Grey, eyed Athena presently cast a sweet sleep on her eyes. The swineherd had the horned bow in his hands moving toward Odysseus, when the crowd in the banquet hall broke into an ugly din, shouts rising from the flushed young men, ho! Where do you think you are taking that, you smutty slave? What is this dithering? We'll toss you back alone among the pigs, for your own dogs to eat, if bright Apollo nods and the gods are kind. He faltered, all at once put down the bow, and stood in panic, buffeted by waves of cries, hearing Telemachos from another quarter shout, Go on, take him the bow. Do you obey this pack? You will be stoned back to your hills. Young as I am my power is over you. I wish to God I had as much the upper hand of these. There would be suitors pitched like dead rats through our gate, for the evil plotted here. Telemachos' frenzy struck someone as funny, and soon the whole room roared with laughter at him, so that all tension passed. Eumaeus picked up bow and quiver, making for the door, and there he placed them in Odysseus' hands. Calling Eurycleia to his side he said, Telemachos trusts you to take care of the women's doorway. Lock it tight. If anyone inside should hear the shock of arms or groans of men in hall or court, not one must show her face, but go on with her weaving. The old woman nodded and kept still. She disappeared into the women's hall, bolting the door behind her. Philoishios left the house now at one bound, cat-like, running to bolt the courtyard gate. A coil of deck, rope of papyrus fiber lay in the gateway, this he used for lashing and ran back to the same stool as before, fastening his eyes upon Odysseus. And Odysseus took his time, turning the bow, tapping it, every inch, for borings that termites might have made while the master of the weapon was abroad. The suitors were now watching him, and some jested among themselves, a bow lover. Dealer in old bows. Maybe he has one like it at home. Or has an itch to make one for himself. See how he handles it, the sly old buzzard. And one disdainful suitor added this, may his fortune grow an inch for every inch he bends it. But the man skilled in all ways of 
contending, satisfied by the great bow's look and heft, like a musician, like a harper, when with quiet hand upon his instrument he draws between his thumb and forefinger a sweet new string upon a peg, so effortlessly Odysseus in one motion strung the bow, then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it, so the taut got vibrating hummed and sang a swallow's note. In the hushed hall it smote the suitors and all their faces changed. Then Zeus thundered overhead, one loud crack for a sign. And Odysseus laughed within him that the son of crooked, minded Kronos had flung that omen down. He picked one ready arrow from his table where it lay bare, the rest were waiting still in the quiver for the young man's turn to come. He knocked it, let it rest across the hand grip, and drew the string and grooved butt of the arrow, aiming from where he sat upon the stool. Now flashed arrow from twanging bow clean as a whistle through every socket ring and grazed not one, to thud with heavy brazen head beyond. Then quietly Odysseus said, Telemachus, the stranger you welcomed in your hall has not disgraced you. I did not miss, neither did I take all day stringing the bow. My hand and I are sound, not so contemptible as the young men say. The hour has come to cook their lordship's mutton, supper by daylight. Other amusements later, with song and harping that adorn a feast. He dropped his eyes and nodded, and the prince Telemachus, true son of King Odysseus, belted his sword on, clapped hand to his spear, and with a clink and glitter of keen bronze stood by his chair in the forefront near his father.